Greetings. This event is sponsored by Faculty Council, the Staff Advisory Council, Missouri Students Association, and the Graduate uh, Professional Council, and we thank those organizations for uh, their sponsorship. Uh, I thank you for coming. And I particularly thank those of you who are on nine-month appointments uh, who have come here on your basically your own time. So thank you very much uh, for doing that. This is an important event. Uh, and to stress that importance, uh, the president of the university himself is here. May I present President Wolf, please. Harry, thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, Harry, how do I get a nine-month appointment? <laughs> See me. <laughs> See you. Okay, thank you. I uh, appreciate uh, everybody uh, being here. This is our second public forum. The first one was uh, Monday. This, uh, we've had some other uh, forums, uh, but not in this kind of environment. Uh, and obviously, this is uh, uh, important because it's, it's the necessary input uh, that we need in search for our next MU chancellor. Uh, by taking your own personal time to attend uh, this public forum, you've demonstrated a passion uh, for this university and a recognition of the vital importance of MU and its future in our great state of Missouri. As such, we've all come together on the same page about the need to achieve excellence in the appointment of MU's next chancellor, befitting the university's elite status as a public land-grant AAU institution. Since its founding in 1839, the University of Missouri has been firmly committed to its mission of educating and serving the people of our state and beyond. With its diverse enrollment of almost 35,000 students from across the state, nation, and the world, and over 270,000 alumni worldwide, and more than 13,000 employees, MU has emerged in the 21st century as a leader in teaching, research, service, and economic development. Such an institution demands, demands a dynamic leader who accepts nothing less than the ongoing pursuit and attainment of excellence. Our university has a unique mission and requires a leader who can champion the benefits of accessible, high-quality public higher education, foster the growth of rich economic development potential characteristic of a research university, be able to engage the many constituents that support this university, support and enable campus leaders to achieve their goals, and to constantly think, rethink, and innovate all the ways that a 174-year-old institution can educate students, advance our state by creating jobs, delivering solutions, and building new opportunities to advance Missouri's future prosperity. Like the leaders that came before, the next chancellor of the University of Missouri must understand and respect our historic institution, its stakeholders, and its role in Missouri. He or she must seize strategic opportunities, cultivate important relationships, and lead this university to new levels of greatness. As president of the University of Missouri system, be assured that we will be working diligently to identify the next outstanding leader for our university. We are committed to a selection process that will be broad and inclusive, and with emphasis on including input from many stakeholders as possible. And that means everyone, including faculty, staff, students, alumni, retirees, extension, healthcare, business community, and partners across the state, as well as you here today. And what we're here today to talk about is what are we looking for and how do we prioritize those skills, competencies, and experiences that go into selection of the next chancellor. We're exercising our due diligence to ensure that there is balance, including establishing a search committee that will assist in identifying prospective candidates that will play an integral role in finding and aggressively pursuing the best candidates in the profession. We expect to be, named, uh, be naming the members of the search committee, which will include a broad representation of campus constituency groups, like I've mentioned previously, faculty, staff, students, alumni, retirees, extension, and other units that comprise this great university system. And we expect to announce the names of the people on the search committee uh, by the end of the week. We're very, very close. We were hoping to do it this morning, but I think uh, we'll have to wait till maybe tomorrow, but for sure by the end of the week. And because we expect to select from the very best people for this most prestigious position, we will keep the names of all candidates strictly confidential. 
Along with my team, I'm committed to being transparent and accountable about the process. We cannot, however, disclose any details related to candidates which would complicate our intent on securing the very best talent. We all know higher education is highly competitive. Our university is engaging in an external search for a new chancellor for the first time in two decades. And it is happening at the same time as other prestigious universities are looking for leaders, those like the Ohio State, the Ohio State Michigan, North Carolina, Florida, Penn State, just to name a few prestigious units, universities are also looking for a new leader. The last thing we want to do is jeopardize our ability to secure the best possible candidate for MU Chancellor because the name of that candidate has been made public. For that reason, we will keep the identities of potential con candidates confidential. We have a timetable for this search that is aggressive yet reasonable. Given the market and the attractiveness of the University of Missouri, uh, we believe that we will be very competitive in selecting a uh, wide candidate pool and finding the right next chancellor. We're aiming to have that new chancellor identified and named by uh, the end of the fall semester. That being said, we will not sacrifice quality for time. And in, in the event that it takes a little bit longer to fight, find the right candidate, uh, we will go uh, past the end of the fall semester. Our great university demands such a process, uh, but before we get to that point, it's crucial that we continue the process we've laid out of getting comprehensive input from the many important constituencies that I already mentioned, which is why I've begun this process, meeting with various stakeholders, such as faculty and staff across the state. Uh, we had a, a conversation with, uh, with Extension uh, Monday night, uh, which was well attended by, I think, 200 to 300 people we were taking account. But great conversation, great input. Been talking to alumni, academic leaders, and prominent supporters of the university to also get their thoughts on the traits that they desire in a new chancellor. But today, today is the second uh, of our two town hall forums uh, involving the university community and public. You'll get your opportunity to have your voices heard this morning. We want all of you to thoroughly understand this process and be deep, deeply engaged in our search. Uh, we will take the information and feedback we receive from these meetings and it will help form the basis along with input from other constituency groups as we develop our formal position description and develop our charge that we give to the search committee. I look forward this morning to hearing your observations and answering any questions you might have. So please do not be shy about stepping up to one of the two microphones that we have here in the room. The next hour is all about you. Uh, so please get involved. As you make your points, though, I'd like to prompt uh, a few questions for you. Again, uh, as I said uh, previously, it does, you don't have to comment specifically to these questions. If you have other ideas or thoughts and you want to com comment, please feel free. But what uh, we're trying to do is at least get these specific uh, questions answered so that we can uh, collate or consolidate all the input from these various public forums so that at least we've got uh, valued input on a consistent basis across all these listening opportunities that we can prioritize. The three questions that you see on the screen in front of you are, what do you think are the requis requisite competencies, attributes, and traits of our next chancellor? Uh, based on those, how do you prioritize these qualities? And then the last, lastly, what do you think are necessary areas of strength that the next chancellor must embody to take us to the next level as a university? Let's keep these themes uh, uh, in mind as we move through the next hour or so and engage in this dialogue. I also want to point out for those of you that don't feel comfortable making a comment today or later on after you uh, learn more about the search, uh, you want to provide a comment, there is a way if you look at the, the uh, uh, URL at the bottom of the screen, you're going to see that's how you keep current on the search process. We already have a lot of information up there on this site. Uh, I'd ask that you continue to hit the site if you're interested in uh, how we're progressing on the process, but also on that site is an opportunity in the lower right-hand corner to uh, submit input or submit another question or comment that you might have. Before we begin, I want to uh, again thank you for agreeing to be part of this process and commend you for your passion uh, for the University of Missouri. So let's jump in. Uh, again, we've got uh, uh, microphones on both sides uh, and we are ready for your input. We have heard in the past um, that we would like to see a chancellor who has uh, a sensitivity for shared governance. Uh, the idea that uh, faculty and administrators work together to solve 
the university's problems is an important idea. It takes hold of uh, the constituency and brings them up to speed to the notions of the progress that the university is making. Uh, he needs to be a distinguished scholar. He needs to understand, he or she needs to understand what it takes uh, to become a world-class uh, scholar. We would expect an, an experienced administrator. We would expect an able politician uh, and a problem solver. And probably very important is to raise money, uh, not only because of the uh, uh, chronic financial straits that we find ourselves in, but we do have a major uh, fundraising campaign uh, coming up. So this is an important uh, contributor. So how would I rank these priorities? Well, I think I would rank them equally. <laughs> and I would rank them equally by saying that this person has to be of high quality. Mm -hmm. And I believe their person of high quality would have these skills in abundance and would be able to uh, provide us with the necessary leadership. Uh, it is difficult to say he needs to be a fundraiser over a scholar. I mean, those are, those are just, that's just a non-starter conversation. This person needs to be of high quality, and I would urge uh, that a high quality individual, a person who is accomplished, be uh, selected as the next chancellor. Thank you, Harry. I can't disagree with anything that you said. Uh, your emphasis on quality is what this institution deserves, um, and that is what we're going to be looking for, uh, and I appreciate that input. Well said. And by the way, just uh, we are, we're capturing this. We're taking copious notes as well as we're also recording this um, so that we can make sure that all the input is consolidated and expressed appropriately in the job description as well as to the search committee. So thank you for that, Harry. Hi, um, my name is Rebecca Calvin, and I work in the Chancellor's Diversity Initiative on campus. And um, while we have some fantastic administrators in Jesse Hall, we don't have much diversity. And I would really like to see a chancellor who is uh, diverse, and also I'd like to see um, a chancellor who is committed to creating an inclusive campus environment uh, that will really help prepare our faculty, staff, and students to compete in a global, global market. Thank you. Great comment. By the way, Rebecca, I think, I, I think that's, a, uh, that's a new one, so I appreciate that. So that's, again, an example of adding to, uh, to the, uh, the priorities that we need to look for. So thank you. I appreciate that. Hello. I'm Wendy Sims, professor of music education. With regard to attributes, in addition to what uh, my colleagues have said, I hope the next chancellor will understand the breadth of all that MU has to offer, as Chancellor Deaton does. More specifically, the importance of the arts and humanity, the importance that the arts and humanities have for an elite, comprehensive land grant university that aspires to greatness. I hope he or she will understand that even those of us who may not bring in research dollars still make many substantial contributions to scholarship and research and to the development of students' creative and critical thinking skills, and will realize that our contributions to the culture and economy of the campus, community, state, and beyond are real and are intrinsically valuable to the overall quality and excellence of this university. As far as competency, I would like to know that a candidate for chancellor can articulate a vision for the campus that acknowledges this, and that there is at least one member of the search committee who will actively represent the interests of the arts and humanities on this campus. Thank you for this opportunity to provide input. Thank you, Wendy. Appreciate that. I hope you will see uh, when we announce the search committee that we have that representation. Um, I can't answer that question definitively since we don't we haven't uh, completed the uh, the naming of the search committees. But I, I hope that you do see that. Other input. I'm Bill Lamberson, professor of animal sciences. Um, I'd like to make one suggestion, given the relatively small representation of faculty and staff that are here today, it might be well to, ha to have these listed on uh, Mizzou Info to allow uh, information to be brought in um, from faculty and staff that, that aren't represented. I also have a, a question or concern that um, how much opportunity will faculty and staff on the search committee have in the search process? So will they be Will they have the opportunity to review the, the uh, candidates at an early stage in the process, or will it only be um, 
I hate to say after a decision's been made, but at, at least at a, a, a very late stage in the process, I, I would like to see or hope to see that, that the search committee has an opportunity to participate very actively through the search process rather than just in the late stages. Great question, Bill. Uh, the comment on getting this, these questions out on Mizzou Info is, is appropriate. Uh, thanks for that suggestion. We'll do that. To your second point, which is a little bit more depth and detail on the search process uh, and will faculty uh, be involved um, throughout the process? The answer is yes. So let me tell you how by getting a little bit more into the mechanics of the search process and tell you that, uh, first of all, we've hired the search firm. It's the same search firm that we worked with in uh, producing uh, a great, uh, great uh, new leader for the University of Missouri system, Dr. Hank Foley, who came from Penn State. We used the same firm. We challenged them to uh, conduct the search in a matter of three months, uh, which they did successfully. It's not typical uh, in, uh, in higher ed to, to go that fast. And uh, we wanted to challenge them challenge uh, the search firm to, to work under those time constraints because we felt I felt that uh, we can get it done. Uh, and I also wanted to have uh, Dr. Foley named before uh, Vice President Nikki Krawitz uh, retired so that we could do the transition of strategic planning to the new vice president. So we challenged them. Uh, we pulled it off. The great thing about uh, working with this firm is they're knowledgeable uh, about the University of Missouri system. Uh, uh, this great state of Missouri, the requirements. Uh, also, they work very, very well with us, uh, and they're up for the challenge. As you know, most of the great candidates don't come in responding to ads that are in the Chronicle or someplace else. The great candidates are pulled out of their seats or pulled out of their comfort zone by great search firms that have been in, in this industry for quite some time, and they know they know the people because maybe they've placed them previously or they just stay close uh, and they go have conversations and, and open up the eyes of those candidates that perhaps didn't know about the opening or hadn't considered the the, op the opportunity. So it's their, uh, they have to create the, the largest uh, candidate pool that they possibly can. And they create the candidate pool, then the next step and the candidate pool that they create, again, is based on the job description, based on the charge that we're given to the search committee, as well as the search firm. So once the candidate pool is created, uh, that candidate pool uh, is given to uh, the search committee to have uh, the conversations. And they start to prioritize and listen and ask the questions, the whole entire search committee. And they start the process of taking that search pool and, and making it smaller and smaller and smaller they get to a point that they determine that there's finalists. And sometimes it's two, sometimes it's three, sometimes it could be as much as five. They determine the finalists. Uh, and that's the point in time that I get involved. I have no idea who's in the candidate pool. I have no influence on who gets into the candidate pool. I have no influence in terms of uh, what comes out of the search committee. The search committee produces the finalists. What they give me in terms of the finalists are obviously the names and the information that appears on the, the standardized form that uh, we get, which includes the resume, previous history, as well as some of that. So I have, uh, as the, the next step in the process, is I have an unbiased uh, view of what's on the paper, uh, and then I have the, the, the conversation with, with the, uh, the finalists. I use the same criteria that's in the job description and the, and the prioritization of that criteria. I use that same uh, same information to question the candidates on their competitiveness against that criteria. I go through that, uh, make my notes, make my comments. Then the next step is I go back to the search committee, and it's the entire search committee. And you'll see the appropriate representation of the constituency groups that I talk to. So the questions that I ask, that I, I go, the way we go through it is search committee, tell me what you saw on this particular uh, criteria. I'll just use the example of, uh, Harry brought up scholarly, scholarly work. Um, uh, what did you see? And they, they go through and, and make the comments uh, of what they've seen. Uh, and then I, I, I question those because sometimes they see something that I don't see. And I see something they don't see. So I say, I saw this, you saw that. How come I saw this and you saw that? So we have this nice interchange. And we go through candidate by candidate, uh, uh, criteria by criteria. Then at the end of I've heard what they've heard, what they've seen, they've heard what I've seen. Then we have a conversation of based on that, what of these finalists do you think is number one, number two, number three? We come to an agreement. 
We've used this process for the chancellor selection at SNT, uh, which went very, very well with Chancellor Schrader being being uh, named, as well as the same process uh, uh, with Hank Foley that went well. In both situations, uh, both the search committee and I unanimously agreed after this conversation as who the number one candidate is, and then we went forward with the negotiation of the number one candidate. Uh, if for whatever reason the number one candidate uh, didn't work out, then we could drop back to number two. Fortunately, in both situations that I just talked about, it was the number one candidate. So it's been a, a, a process that is driven, is driven and, and totally influenced by the search committee. So, um, and, it, and it's worked well, and I, I fully expect for it to work well again. So, um, and it, and it was a bit, di it was a bit different than what my search went through, which is basically the board was the search committee and they produced me to a, a group uh, and they only produced one candidate to the group, so there was a little bit of uh, criticism. I thought it was great, but obviously, <laughs> because I was the candidate that they put in front of the committee, but maybe the other candidates didn't think it was so great that didn't get produced or put in front of the committee. But um, regardless, th that that's the difference in terms of the search process that I'm using and the search process that was used for me. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited about the potential. I'd love to hear, Bill, if you've got some better ideas in terms of how we're going to run it, but that's how we're going to do this. Good morning, President Wolf. This is, I'm Latricia from NSEI. Mm -hmm. um, and regarding to ethics um, in the person that we are looking for, I am hoping that that person will be very conscious of the CRR and that they will follow those. And by the way, I'm very happy with your ethics myself. Thank I'm you. happy about that. Um, I know there's a lot of competition out there for positions like this, and you have to offer a great package to get someone to come here. Um, but I'm also asking that as you consider that package, not only do you consider that our funding is being constantly cut, but also that Columbia has one of the lowest costs of living in the nation. and this place is such a great place to live. I wish they'd quit advertising it because we're growing so fast. <laughs> right. um, but please consider, you know, those two things. We don't have to offer a multi-million dollar package. Right. Thank you. Great, great input. Uh, and that question came up previously in terms of how much are you going to budget for this? I, I have no budget for this. Um, I, I want to pay what is competitive based on uh, the job responsibilities and the candidate pool um, that's out there, but an appreciation of the cost of living, um, as well as some other factors, uh, certainly, certainly, certainly will be in the mix, uh, and that's great input. Um, and I, the, the good thing about um, attracting candidates, as as I've been through um, these uh, two different searches, is for those that are in the know in higher education, they. In talking with my peers and being at these meetings, they they know uh, that uh, there's wonderful things that occur here at MU, and this is a very very strong brand. And there's some mind-boggling things that come here. The only thing I do hear is criticism, as you all, for some reason, are, are insufficient at, at bragging, are, are are talking about what you do, um, and, and because we know what you do and and the greatness, and, and so you all need to be better at communicating and I don't know if that's because of of the show me mentality I'm not I'm not sure what it is but um, in talking with the search firm and the search this is a search firm that just placed um, the new um, chancellor at University of Wisconsin Madison as well I believe didn't they, didn't they do this one um, so they're they're real current in terms of placing chancellors uh, they believe uh, that we could go even faster and it's to our advantage of going faster because of those that are out there. And they believe that they're very excited about this opportunity because there is a is a brand that's been established and a leadership position that is unique and different than some of the other institutions. We're not in a death spiral. We're not in a crisis. We're not coming off a huge issue. And uh, so having somebody that comes in that recognizes uh, that there is significant value in, in what's been established and huge potential in the future, they believe that we're in a unique position and we should capitalize on it by moving very fast, which is what we are doing, is moving very fast on this. 
uh, I have um, been asked, you know, why are you doing all these public forums in July? As, you know, there's people with nine-month assignments. The students aren't here. I'd love to be doing this um, in September or whatever, but I want, at the, at the end of the day, I want the best possible next chancellor here, and if we have to take some risk and, and do some things like public forums uh, in July, we have to do that right now and try to reach out to those that aren't on campus right now as much as possible so that they can be part of this process and giving them input. Uh, but we're, uh, we're excited about, we're very, very excited about this opportunity and very interested in looking at uh, what kind of candidates we can attract into the pool. Uh, my name is Kisha Duncan, and I supervise the Standardized Testing Center here on campus. And in a volunteer capacity, uh, the other thing that I do is I'm the current chair of the Staff Compensation Task Force, um, which is a task force that was set in place as a result of SPRAC, or the Strategic Planning mm -hmm. Resource and Advisory Council. And we've been charged with finding creative, sort of out-of-the-box ways, um, both monetary and non-monetary, to increase compensation for staff. And as a staff member um, and a member of that group, one of the ideas we've been trying to get off the ground is the notion of establishing a mentoring and succession uh, program. And I think it's really important to staff who are kind of, pardon this expression, kind of trapped in middle management, if you, if you will, um, to, to have a chancellor who recognizes the value and the importance of staff competency at all levels and sees a lot of value in growing our own talent and providing opportunities to staff who have proven competency, um, been good employees and want to stay at the university in advance, but kind of get as far as they can and run up against a brick wall and feel like the only opportunity they have is to go to another institution in many cases, which is sad because then we lose a lot of talent. Yep. Um, and that happens with both faculty and staff, but more often with staff than it really needs to if there was some sort of organized way in the way of a mentoring and or succession planning program. So I hope the I hope that's something that will be asked of the candidates um, and that the new chancellor will, will care about um, right. staff at all levels and their ability to move forward and be mentored and guided into opportunities that will end up uh, affording them additional compensation. Thank you. Thank you, Keisha. Great point. The um, uh, one of the things that we're going to be, I'm sure, providing to all the the candidates is uh, information about the University of Missouri system as well as MU. Uh, a year and a half ago, when I when I began, we established six priorities for all four campuses in the system. One of those priorities was attracting and retaining the best possible talent in the market. Uh, and attracting and retaining means uh, a lot of things. You got to uh, pay people competitively, invest in their future, have succession planning, uh, and that cri th those priorities were reached by a conversation with the general officers, which are the four chancellors in the system, vice presidents that report directly to me. We iterate, uh, iterated on those, agreed that those were six priorities. One of them was the attracting and retaining the best and the brightest. Uh, then we uh, reviewed this with the Board of Curators. The Board of Curators agreed as well. My compensation, my annual compensation, is, is based on the, uh, the improvements against attracting and retaining. Uh, also, each of the four chancellors have that same um, metric, and their compensation is based on that as well. Uh, we did succession planning uh, in a way uh, that was unique and in-depth for the first time, as I understand, in many, many, many years. And it's not something that is easy to do if you've never done it before. But the focus of succession planning is to really work on um, what are the candidates that can step in, not just on an interim basis, but on a permanent basis for those openings that are created. Maybe they're planned openings or unplanned openings, but trying to promote more from within than everything is an external search. And I was very excited about the work that uh, all four campuses did in terms of identifying those candidates uh, from a succession planning standpoint, but also not just the identification of the candidate as a potential successor to a specific role, but also what are you doing to invest in them so that they have the opportunity to not only compete but be successful and step into that new role. So we're starting. We made progress. We have more to do. And uh, rest assured that this isn't going to be a one-time event. It'll be an annual uh, review, an annual conversation that we'll have that will help you in what you're doing from a mentoring standpoint. We have more work to do on that, but I, I'm, I applaud you for um, also offering that up because that's key to attracting uh, new talent as well as, as retaining uh, existing employees. 
So thank you, great comment. So again, summarizing a long answer, but what we're going to do is inform the candidates as to what has taken place. Let me now just diverge again to a comment that uh, I heard uh, in one of the previous forums. So we've done all this great work in terms of establishing these committees and strategic plan, establishing these committees on competitive staff compensation. We've done a lot of these things. Are you expecting the, new ca the candidate to come in and scrap all those? The answer is absolutely not. There's been great work that's done. I would have hoped that the candidate uh, pool uh, looks at the great great work and efforts and focus and priorities and stuff like that and builds off of them, not looks to just say, I'm new, I'm different, I want to scrap everything. So that's um, uh, that would be information that we would, we would provide to the candidate uh, and look for candidates that, that are thinking about building off of it. Because again, uh, what we're looking for in a candidate is different than somebody that's in crisis or in a death spiral. If you're in a crisis or a death spiral, you're looking for a candidate with certain skills uh, and competencies. We're not in that situation. So our our uh, job description in our list of priorities or competencies that uh, are necessary are different than uh, other institutions that have issues. Not that we don't have issues. We, everybody's got issues, but the degree of our issues and, and the, 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 the type of our issues are different than some others. Good morning. I'm Joan Hermson, Chair of the Department of Women's and Gender Studies. Um, I want to kind of bounce back to hiring a diverse person for this position. I've sort of noticed over the last month as people have been talking about this new person, the word he is repeatedly used, um, and then people catch themselves. To me, um, the fact that we haven't had a, um, an external hire in two decades does sort of symbolize um, the entrenched old boys network on this campus. And one way to sort of send the message that MU isn't, doesn't want to be that anymore and that we believe in women as leaders would be to um, select a woman. You've done it before. Uh -huh. I have a lot of confidence that you, there are great women out there and that you'll be able to do that. And I say it not just as chair of a department of women's and gender studies, but as a female faculty member who has career aspirations and talks to women faculty every day across this campus who have career aspirations and, um, are you know, also entrenched in an institution that is, um, has a pretty strong old boys network. And I'm gonna, I say that, and a lot of people won't say that publicly, so. Thank you. I, I applaud you for saying it, Joan. Oh, that, that deserves a round of applause, appreciate that. Um, so, heard loud and clear, um, help me. Help me help the search committee uh, in that, if you all know any candidates, female, male, whatever, if you know candidates, make sure you drive them towards the website. There's a way of uh, uh, interested candidates uh, can get to the search firm. And, and, and also, by the way, there are people that are already submitting interest. Uh, so it's, it's, it's off and running. But if you've got some people uh, that you know personally or you've got some people that you admire from afar but you don't know personally, uh, please submit those names uh, through the search process. and. That search firm will reach out to them and try to qualify them as quickly as possible so that they can get into the mix. So um, think about that as well. Good input, though. Thank you. Thank you very much for making time for this. One of the things that strikes me as we look forward is that um, we are in a, a, an ocean of change in higher ed. And so somebody who really gets that big picture and can lead us through that um, and has a really good grounding on where higher ed is and, and where we think it might be going. Um, we also have a lot of change, just demographically speaking, um, that's coming at us in leadership on this campus. So. Um, being able to manage through enormous change in, in the coming decade is going to be crucial for us. But with that, I think one thing that seems important is to retain what's made MU special. And one of the things that's special about MU is an atmosphere of relative comity among ourselves. We're fractious and we're, fra you know, faculty don't always get what we want and um, there's a lot of scrapping sometimes. But the reality is compared to many higher ed organizations, we have an atmosphere of collaboration that is pretty unusual. And so somebody who really understands how important that's going to be for our success and to, to build off of Chancellor Deaton's uh, track record of um, supporting collaboration across units on our campus is going to be very important for us. So for what it's worth, thank you thank for your you. time. Good point. So let me... Um, 
let me prompt uh, the last question in particular, which is, uh, Laura touched on the, the complexities and the change that's happening in the marketplace in terms of demographic shifts, requirements of students, requirements of employees and faculty. Uh, we, we have to react, respond, and, and have an opportunity to lead uh, by uh, the repositioning that we're doing and the investment in, in our future that uh, is embodied in the strategic plan that came that has been developed here at MU. What are the characteristics um, that you would suggest we prioritize for that next leader to take us to the future? What, what, what would you recommend or what would you ask us to think about? This is the interactive part of the program. Thanks. So <clears throat> as, as somebody who was involved in that process, um, I think that, uh, and I'm Michael Misfun, I'm from the School of Medicine, also a professor in uh, microbiology and immunology. I think <clears throat> Laura's kind of pointed it out, uh, we're in a world of change. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody from the School of Medicine, as everybody hears every day, healthcare is changing dramatically, and that's what we need to have a leader that's very visionary because for our survival we've got to be agile we've got to be able to kind of predict what the future is going to bring from a higher education point of view from all different aspects and i think the chancellor has to understand the complexity of this university but also take us to the next level because i think in some ways you made the point we don't do a good job of bragging, but we've accomplished a lot, but we could accomplish a lot more in the mm -hmm. future if we have a really strong visionary leader, and I think that's so important. Strategic plan is there. It's, it's somewhat of a blueprint for the future, but mm -hmm. again, it's going to take a very um, courageous leader yeah. to make those tough decisions to take us to that next level. Right. And that, that's going to be so important. So Good point. Yeah. Uh, good point in terms of a visionary and courage and commitment towards uh, a future goal. Uh, what a, what uh, is difficult in the search process uh, is trying to determine quality of vision uh, especially when, when somebody comes in as being interviewed and, and you're really looking at their quality of the, of the vision or the, the, the clarity of their vision from the past, asking them to, to talk about the vision here without, I mean, they do some due diligence, they do a ton of due diligence. It's very impressive as you go through these searches how much homework and research the candidates do. Uh, because when they get to me, um, they're, pretty qualified by a great search committee, but their knowledge about what uh, is occurring or what's not occurring is very much informed by what they read, but also what you've got on your website, and so making sure everything is current there. Uh, but one of the challenges, as Michael uh, described, is, is trying to, out of an interview process, uh, really determine um, how visionary somebody is. It's a, it's. It's something we have to think about, but something that uh, there isn't a there isn't a test or a questionnaire that you can give and say this one's highly visionary and this one's not. Uh, I'll also comment on there is uh, as part of the process. I didn't go through this in response to Bill's question, but it's it's important to um, talk about this as well. Uh, Michael was talking about, Michael represents uh, our great health system, and the health system has been using a external organization called Talent Plus uh, to uh, give some outside assessment on skills and competencies uh, and makeup of certain individuals. It's been proven successful for them. We've, we use it as well. We used it for the last search. We plan to use it for this search as well. And it goes through a very in-depth um, study that's been proven that starts to bring out uh, some of the interpersonal and, and interpersonal skills and communication skills and leadership skills that um, these individuals have. Uh, and it's, it's very, very insightful. So the great thing about using them is you get, uh, you see what's on paper, you hear what's, what happens uh, in the conversation, in the interview, 
that you personally participate in. Obviously, you've got a, a well-rounded search committee that hears it as well, but you could have a candidate that looks great on paper and interviews very, very well, but really knows what to say, but in real life, day to day, doesn't really exhibit those traits, though they say they do. And what this does is it pulls out really um, through it a very interesting way. It pulls out those traits. And also some of my direct reports have gone through this as well. And I've had to, I went through this, by the way, as part of my search. Uh, and I've been through it in my previous roles as well. And it's very informative to me in terms of where highlighting where, where my strengths and weaknesses are and putting plans in place to, to shore up some of those weaknesses. So I believe in it personally. Um, and uh, uh, we're going to be using this as well because that, that is a guide that uh, also is um, uh, very interesting in proving out some of the assumptions that you have, and sometimes they're different. So again, um, I believe that element in the process also prevents us from hiring somebody that's great on paper and great in an interview, but not so great when she or he hits, hits the street running Other input? Well, then seeing none, I want to thank you again for uh, your passion for MU. Again, reiterating that if there is a question that's on your mind and you didn't want to ask, uh, there is an opportunity to ask it there. I think everybody here knows how to get a hold of me anyway, so feel free to reach out to me directly. But the, the advantage of of putting it onto the website is we're monitoring that uh, on a frequent basis and and we'll respond to that but we'll also capture that and consolidate it with others so I'd, I'd ask that I direct you to that site and uh, again look for the this week uh, we will publish the search committee and look for updates on the progress that and they will be on that website so again thank you for your participation have a great day